Section 1031 provides a rule of non-recognition for exchanges of like-kind property. The statute provides that a property is exchanged for other property of like kind, and both the property transferred and that received are either held for productive use in the trade or business or for investment, then generally speaking, neither gain nor loss is recognized. To have a like kind exchange then, we need an exchange of like kind property that satisfies the holding requirement. We'll first consider the consequences of having a like kind exchange, and then we'll look at each of these requirements and how they shape the manner in which like-kind exchanges are carried out today. When we're done, we'll see that most real estate exchanges are multi-party deferred transactions. Let's first consider the consequences of having a like-kind exchange. If one completes a qualifying like-kind exchange, then loss with respect to the like-kind property disposed of is not recognized, and gain is only recognized to the extent that boot is received. Boot is any property received in the exchange other than like-kind property. It's important to understand that 1031, like any rule of non-recognition, is a rule of deferral. The gain or loss that goes unrecognized today will ultimately be recognized when there is a subsequent disposition of the property that doesn't qualify for non-recognition treatment. The unrecognized gain or loss is deferred through the assignment of basis to the like-kind property received. Let's consider this example. T owns an office building held as a rental with a fair market value of $100 and adjusted basis of 80. He exchanges his building with X, who owns a similar building with a fair market value of $95. In addition, X pays T $5 to equalize the exchange. T intends to hold the acquired building as a rental property. Well, first, T qualifies for 1031 treatment because he has exchanged like-kind property for like-kind property, and both the building disposed of and that acquired are held for business use. So what happens? T has a realized gain of $20. His amount realized of $100, comprising X's $95 building plus $5 of cash, less his adjusted basis of $80. Because T received $5 in cash, he must recognize gain to that extent, leaving $15 of gain unrecognized. T's basis in the acquired building is $80, its cost of $95, less the unrecognized gain of $15. Should T turn around and sell the property for its fair market value of $95, he'll have a gain of $15. So you see, all the 1031 did was to defer T's gain until T's later disposition of the building. Now let's consider the requirements for having a like-kind exchange. First, like-kind property. In order to have a tax-deferred exchange under Section 1031, the taxpayer must receive property of like-kind to the property transferred. What does it mean for property to be of like-kind? Though the term is not specifically defined, the regulations draw a distinction between the nature or character of property to which the term refers and its grade or quality to which it does not. As the law has evolved, the term has been applied differently as between real and personal property, with the former given wide latitude and the latter viewed quite narrowly. Real property is considered to be of like kind whether the exchange involves improved realty or unimproved realty, a fee interest for a long-term leasehold, or urban property for rural property. Each represents an interest in real property under local law, and that is all that the regulations require. On the other hand, Personal property must meet exacting standards to be considered of like kind. The regulations provide an objective test for depreciable, tangible personal property. So long as the property exchanged is categorized as being within the same general asset class or within the same product class, it is of like kind. However, other personal team must fit within the general like kind definition. Both the form and function of the properties exchanged must be the same in order to qualify. This is the antithesis of real property, where a 50-unit apartment building can be exchanged for farmland and qualify as like-kind, despite the fact that the underlying investment and associated risk are quite different. We should also take note of the fact that the statute specifically excludes certain types of property. This includes inventory or other property held primarily for sale, securities, debt instruments, and partnership interests. The effect of this exclusion is simple. Excluded property cannot be the subject of a 1031 exchange, even if it is otherwise of like kind. 
Because of the dichotomy between the treatment of real property and personal property, like-kind exchanges ordinarily fall into one of two camps. Either they involve swaps of real estate or trade-ins of business equipment. Our focus will be on real estate exchanges. Let's next consider the holding requirement. In order to have a tax-deferred exchange under 1031, the taxpayer must have held the property for productive use in a trade or business or for investment and must hold the replacement property for productive use in a trade or business or for investment. The statute does not require that the transferred property and its replacement be held for a like purpose. This requirement is satisfied if business property is exchanged for investment property or vice versa. The fact that the properties being exchanged must be held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment means that personal use property is not eligible for Section 1031 treatment. Now let's talk about exchanges. In order to qualify for non-recognition, like-kind properties must be exchanged for one another. An exchange occurs when property other than money is received for property. On the other hand, a sale occurs when money is received for property. Since Section 1031 requires an exchange, a sale of property followed by a reinvestment of the sales proceeds in like-kind property will not qualify. Consider the following examples. A, who owns Black Acre, which is real property, wishes to exchange it for like-kind property. B, wishes to acquire Black Acre, but he has no like-kind property to transfer to A. C, is selling White Acre, another piece of real property, and C, wants cash. A sells Black Acre to B and uses the sales proceeds to acquire White Acre from C. This can be viewed as follows. Section 1031 is not available to A because he made a cash sale to B followed by a purchase from C. Section 1031 requires an exchange of properties. So consider this third example. Suppose instead that in example two, A and C first exchanged properties, then C sold Black Acre to B for cash. A has now exchanged his property with C for C's property rather than selling his property for cash. This transaction produces the same end result as the transaction in example two. A owns C's property, B owns A's property, and C is cashed out. However, in this case, A gets 1031 treatment. The moral to the story, form can govern substance under section 1031. The difference here is that A never received cash. In example two, he did. An exchange by definition is a transfer of property for property. A sale is a transfer of property for money or a promise of money. Cash is what distinguishes an exchange from a sale. These examples illustrate an important fact of life. It is rare to encounter a situation where two parties are interested in swapping properties with one another. The more realistic situation is what we've seen in these examples. One party, A in our examples, wishes to enter into a 1031 exchange. A second party, B, wishes to buy that property, and a third party, C, is selling a property that the first party would like to acquire. If A can persuade either B or C to accommodate him, A will have the desired exchange, and both B and C will wind up with what they wanted all along. In the case of B, that means Black Acre, and for C, it's cash. And that means that either C must be willing to exchange properties with A, and then sell Black Acre to B, which is what occurs in example three, or B must be willing to acquire White Acre from C and then exchange it with A for Black Acre. Not surprisingly, people standing in the shoes of B and C are often unwilling to do this. So what does A do? A hires a middleman to accommodate the exchange. So example four involves A, who owns Black Acre, which is real property, who wishes to exchange it for like-kind property. B wishes to acquire Black Acre, but he has no like-kind property to transfer to A. C is selling White Acre, another piece of real property, and wants cash. A finds White Acre to be a suitable replacement for Black Acre. Assume that Black Acre and White Acre are of equal value and neither is encumbered. Neither B nor C is willing to enter into a like-kind exchange with A, so A finds X who is willing to act as a middleman. The parties agree as follows. X will acquire White Acre from C for cash. X will acquire Black Acre from A in exchange for White Acre. Finally, X will sell Black Acre to B for cash. 
The transactions close through simultaneous escrows. When the dust clears, everyone has what they want. A owns White Acre, B owns Black Acre, and C has cash. X will earn a fee for facilitating the exchange. This is the manner in which many real estate exchanges are carried out today. And this will work. Using a middleman will enable A to qualify for 1031 treatment. However, a big caveat is in order. If X is acting as A's agent, then X's actions are legally those of A. That is, the agent, X, is merely acting on behalf of his principal, A. Therefore, A is treated as having sold Black Acre to B for cash, and then purchased White Acre from C for cash. Each will be viewed as a separate transaction. They will be treated as a sale, followed by a reinvestment, and 1031 will be inapplicable. If X is not A's agent, then A has completed a like-kind exchange. To be certain of 1031 treatment, A must satisfy one of the safe harbors provided by Regulation Section 1.1031K-1G. For example, if X is a qualified intermediary, A will not be considered to be an actual or constructive receipt of B's funds and therefore has engaged in a qualifying exchange. To be a qualified intermediary, one must satisfy the requirements of Regulation Section 1.1031K-1G4. So as it turns out, in the real world, accommodators are easy to find. Just Google it. To my knowledge, only Nevada requires qualified intermediaries to be licensed. However, many states, including California, require parties acting as qualified intermediaries to comply with certain notice and security requirements, though they aren't otherwise required to be licensed or registered. For what it's worth, there's a trade organization, the Federation of Exchange Accommodators. Now let's consider non-simultaneous exchanges. In the preceding example, the transactions close through simultaneous escrows. While that certainly could occur, in the real world, exchanges are often non-simultaneous. For example, A may have found buyer B, but hasn't yet found a replacement property. B may not be willing to wait around for A to decide, so A will enter into the arrangement we've described in example four, but with one little twist. A will transfer Black Acre to X, X will sell Black Acre to B for cash, A will designate a property to be acquired by X, X will acquire the designated property for cash, and X will transfer the designated property to A in order to complete the exchange for Black Acre. This is an example of a non-simultaneous or deferred exchange. They are also known as Starker exchanges. They will qualify for Section 1031 treatment, provided they satisfy the requirements of Section 1031A3. To qualify, the property to be received in the exchange must be both identified as such on or before 45 days after the taxpayer transfers his property and be received by the earlier of 180 days after the date of transfer or the due date of the return with extensions. The regulations refer to the first requirement as the identification requirement and to the second as the receipt requirement. If either the identification requirement or the receipt requirement is not satisfied, any property received in the exchange will not be treated as like-kind property, resulting in a taxable transaction. So there you have it. Many of the real estate exchanges that occur today are multi-party, non-simultaneous exchanges. Through careful planning, these exchanges will qualify for non-recognition under Section 1031.